our venture capital community tend to be more risk averse. They invest typically post revenue and are more supporting scaling of opportunities. And there's a real need for people to invest in very early stage projects coming out of universities and ventures. Hello, and welcome to the Strategic Partnerships podcast series. My name is Baljano Razbaeva, Manager Strategic Initiatives at UIN, and I'm your host for today. In this week's episode, we have invited Andrew Bailey, Senior Manager of Innovation at University of Cape Town and former president of Sarima, to bring valuable insights into the context of university business collaboration in South Africa, dive deep into their challenges and opportunities, and share some success stories. Plus, stay tuned for the details on the upcoming UIN Forum in South Africa this year. Today, I'm being joined by Andrew Bailey, Senior Manager Innovation at University of Cape Town and past president of SARIMA, South African Research and Innovation Management Association. And today, we're looking to bring a wealth of experience and expertise uh, to the conversation and really discover new horizons of the current landscape and emerging trends when it comes to university industry collaboration, industry's role in fostering relationships between different types of stakeholders and future priorities for South Africa's HEI ecosystem. Andrew, thank you so much for joining. Just before we'll start, I just want to say something that might be in particular interesting for our audience today is the upcoming South African Forum that we're looking to host in collaboration with our South African partners. That is something that is going to happen in spring. Please keep an eye on our website. And this is something that we're extremely excited about because that's going to be the first South African forum of that kind. And I very much look uh, forward to that event. But before we will actually head to South Africa, it would be very nice to learn more about the context of university business collaboration. Please, Andrew, perhaps you could first introduce yourself and we can dig it into our conversation. Thanks very much, Pauzan, and thank you for this this invitation. It's really great to have this opportunity just to have a preliminary discussion ahead of the forum coming up. I think that the forum is going to be very useful for us because of that need to engage more closely with industry within the region. So as um, I'm the immediate past president of SRIMA, the Southern African Research and Innovation Management Association, so represents countries across SADC. And we've managed to get a committee there. Interestingly, it's an organization that also looks after research management in addition to innovation management. And I think that's also quite important for the region because a lot of the sort of more technology transfer, knowledge transfer activities are often first incubated or the nucleus comes from a research office. So I think it's a growing and an exciting phase and it's been great to be involved with projects there. My day job is at the University of Cape Town. And I've been here for just over 15 years, and it's been fantastic just to see the change in technology transfer activity capacity within the country, but also importantly at the university. And it's interesting, we're reflecting back on a report that we did in 2010, and it's actually actually great to do these sort of assessments, the state of tech transfer or, or whatever, because you look back you know, 10 years later, and you can see a lot has happened and changed and positive improvement. Wonderful. Thank you so much on that. Actually, now that uh, some time has passed since the last report, I wonder whether you can share any insights into the current state of university industry collaboration and knowledge transfer in South Africa, maybe also highlighting some of the key challenges and opportunities? Sure. Interestingly, we found that it is probably decreasing compared to 10 years ago in certain sort of elements and sectors. I think that a lot of research within South Africa was dominated by Sassel, a petrochemical company, as well as mining houses. And really significant programs and funding support, new buildings really came from those sort of industry collaborations. 
And, you know, you find with a, a sort of maturing industry, such as the mining one, that often if you have an economic downturn, that then tends to move people away from being able to fund R&D at universities. I think something else that's interesting for us is just where you get your contract research and innovation coming in from. We find that there is not as much from the Western Cape, which is the region that the university is in, but you look at it and often we ironically, because there aren't mines that close to us, do a lot of work for the mining industry. But you're beginning to see changes where, for instance, the medical device sector in the Western Cape has really grown. And I think that it's largely being driven by the University of Stellenbosch and ourselves with very strong biomedical engineering departments. And you've got those biomedical engineering graduates, but you've also got intellectual property going out there. And I think that's been great definitely in the last 10 years to see that whole ecosystem develop. And so I think a lot of our sort of industry interaction is beginning to move into, say, the SME space. So startup companies, that type of thing. Interestingly, also find there have been strong collaborations with finance institutes, be it insurance, et cetera, and fintech has also been, you know, quite interesting. So I, I guess it's a time of renewal and looking for new industry partners. And importantly, too, there's foreign industry where you find that often they are very interested in technologies. I think a challenge for us is sometimes the absorptive capacity of local industry. And that is why, particularly in, say, the pharmaceutical space, we would find that we are actually interacting more with the foreign farmer than, than local farmer. It's great to hear that there is certainly this wave of diversification of not only stakeholder types, but also types of industry in the race of a university industry collaboration. But from your experience, what would you say would be the key factors that would be contributing to that success, to that race uh, and that change that is happening right now in this space? And what would be perhaps the, the challenges that institutions frequently encounter? You already mentioned absorptive capacity, which I think is yeah. not uncommon, but yeah. maybe yeah. there is something else that is very particular for that context specifically. Yeah. So I think one's also got to look at the at the sort of different modes of, of interaction. And I think that the consulting in particular is an interesting one. I think that often the technical experts can provide specific insights or, or whatever. But what it really speaks to is a mismatch maybe in terms of the time horizon to get to results. If it's a smaller company, they're needing a problem solved within a couple of days. Consulting could well assist that. What we're wanting to do is to try and develop longer term interactions with companies to enable one to build a multi-year relationship with them. We've just had a sort of relatively new relationship start with a company that actually focused on developing an autonomous driving car and we had some technology and interestingly that was the reason that we got the interaction but we actually found that specific technology was really not the core thing that they could apply immediately they're still interested in the technology down the line but what it brought in was the opportunity to look at customizing products that are faster to market. And we have a lot of potholes in Johannesburg. And so what they've done is looked at sensing on car bumpers, aggregating the information so that you can effectively map out serious potholes for both drivers to protect themselves, but also insurers and maintainers of, of the roads. And that has led to a number of, of sort of student opportunities with, within the company. I think that's really worthwhile. They landed up applying for particular government funding. And I think that's something that can be a challenge. And if the university 
can assist with accessing these types of government funding schemes, it certainly helps because I think your funding of that collaboration is quite critical. It's interesting because we have some tax incentives. You can deduct 150% of your R&D expenses if, if you're a company, but they tend to be administratively onerous and that then doesn't become as much of an incentive. I think, too, you need people spanning borders who can actually almost interpret the the industry's requirement or need and frame the project um, into the research side, getting the conversation going. And we do that in part through something that we call a catalyst lunch, where we bring together funders, some local industry players, and then researchers from across the university, just to have a lunch where... No one's asking anyone for anything. You're not pitching for money or, or whatever. But you've aligned people with, say, a topic that could be fairly broad, such as imaging, but you've taken medical imaging, computer processing of images, astronomy, software, whatever. Bring all of those sort of people together with industry. And what's interesting is that you find industry making connections with industry, but also your academics sort of chatting about their work and suddenly realizing, oh, yeah, I could do that for you or, or whatever. And one of the things that really shocked me was one of the SMEs, and even more ironically, they were graduates from University of Cape Town said that they were really scared about coming to the university to engage. And they, were through the lunch, realized, actually, yeah, it's not this have to have a very high-tech project and whatever, there's an opportunity to engage. So I think there's a lot about just trying to create these opportunities for engagement. That's a wonderful example of how serendipitous connection can lead to groundbreaking innovations, perhaps, uh, who knows in yeah. the future, but at least there is a start to some sort of connection that has been sparked. And I'm wondering, how would you actually raise their awareness on that? Because I think it's very interesting. And this uh, fact that shocked you so much, I think is also very much shocking to many universities out there, not only in South Africa. So how can we make our potential industry partners aware that the doors are open, there are possibilities, and let's just get together and have a chat just to start with. Yeah, something that we've actually considered in conjunction, we've got quite a good technology transfer office network in the, the Western Cape. There are, are five institutions with tech transfer offices. And something that we discussed is really where one could perhaps have some type of sector-focused event where you can exhibit particular expertise within the university, but maybe frame it also around exploring challenges that a particular industry sector are, are facing. One of the key things is trying to get those key questions into the university researchers' minds, thinking of solutions, because then those solutions have impact and they're going out there for a, a specific local need. And I think that through really events and, and pulling the, the different players together so that they can learn about the, the sort of various capabilities, I think the other thing is around communication. And we are certainly doing a lot more about celebrating sort of spin-off company success or commercialization or new technology or e even awards that, that people win, which is actually getting into, say, more normal sort of media news than technical publications. And that's where people are realizing, gosh, okay, that, that project's a possibility. Through the one, we landed up with a significant investor being attracted to one of our spin-off companies because they're focused on hydrogen fuel cells. And he had a particular interest in green hydrogen and read the informal article. I think it's that type of knowledge and trying to find ways of making it as palatable and interesting as possible. So small bites of information, little video clips, that type of thing. So yeah, we're realizing that's very important for us. That uh, 
completely makes sense to me as well. Just uh, doing that work around communicating actually what is possible. But yeah. now that we have covered most of the university side, I'm wondering what would be your take on the role of industry in this particular setting? How can industry partners actively enhance and foster more collaborations with universities in South Africa? One of the, the touch points is also on your sort of graduate programs where they are on advisory boards for departments and steering the curriculum development, ensuring that you've got relevant graduates going out. And I think giving opportunities for graduates to do some practical experience, be it either in the, the sort of vacation periods or maybe even as part of a, a module in a, a semester to allow them to effectively get that first feel of, of real life industry with, within their field. Because I think a challenge that, interestingly, some of our spin-off companies raised was that the university must do more to business-ready their graduates. And I think that's actually a role where industry could play a role with later stage students and engaging with them more. Sure, there's a level of, of cost in accommodating the students, but often, you know, for the experiential training or whatever, they wouldn't necessarily need to be paid. So I think that's something. The other thing is where industry players get together in a particular sector and they maybe put funding together to focus on specific sort of research topics. And in that way, especially for smaller players, companies will benefit from the research output. Obviously, this is in the pre-competitive space, but you can then have these programs administered, 10 companies putting money in and actually funding a particular research activity area. We've had some very large organizations of, of these sort of consortia where it's multinational, multiple universities, that sort of a thing. But we've also seen an interest where a particular research group has managed to attract several industry partners. And they, so they're not actually interested in the output of that research group, but they're not prescribing specific sort of research contracts or, or whatever. It's more of a, let's see what happens, let's support the group, and then maybe we've got a first right if something comes out that aligns with our business. And I, I think, again, that's, to me, a, a really useful way of um, industry then supporting and guiding re research to a large extent so that it, it meets industry requirements. Thank you for that. Now that we have covered all those things that can be done from both sides, whether it is university, but also industry, I would be also very keen to hear about some of the successful examples that perhaps you would like to highlight. Also, maybe reflecting on the work that you do at the University of Cape Town or any other universities that you work with or may have encountered. Cool. The first one is a company called Cape Biofarms. And then the next example around a government funded program. So it's the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. And it's um, a program called THRIP. And what it does is support the transfer of technology from an, a university into a company, but it's largely also supporting that company in implementing and adopting that technology. It has certain educational elements to it in that they're student bursaries. To me, it's a fantastic program in terms of really supporting tech transfer, but also that engagement with an industry partner. So we have a startup company and the university was able to put some of our so-called evergreen funding towards starting that company up. And we could then leverage it. So 75% came as grant funding from the DTIC program. And this meant that they could buy essential equipment, et cetera, et cetera, and establish their production. And what they're doing is using a relative of the tobacco plant to produce protein. 
and it's a lot more cost effective to use the plants to produce the protein. They're used for various sort of applications from enzymes through to diagnostics to even vaccines. And that has really been an entirely new industry and initiative and bio platform within South Africa that's been developed. And they took two of the initial graduates who were busy with their masters into the company as their initial technical team. And they now have about 60 people three years or so later. That, I think, has been an excellent success story in that the technology is out there. You've got jobs for um, highly skilled graduates. You've got a new business that's that started. And the other one, it was an existing industry partner, Sarah Bell, who actually supply a lot of ingredients to the food and cosmetics industry internationally. And interestingly, they export about 90% of their products. And what our team in chemical engineering had done is developed an extraction process where they could recover phycocyanin from algae. And that can be used as a blue food colorant. And you may know the blue Smarty disappeared from circulation some years back, and it was because of the food colorant that was used. And so blue food colorants are particularly challenging. With this particular one, they've managed to come up with an innovative process, and they've piloted it at the Department of Chemical Engineering using the STRIP funding, and to then managed to do a parallel sort of process up in Johannesburg at their premises. And again, you've got this sort of flow of staff and potential student employment, but it's helping an existing player to extend their offerings. Very impressive case studies. Thank you so much for sharing. In the interest of time, I guess I would uh, like to move uh, to the future looking question. And looking ahead, I I'm very keen to learn from you. What do you believe should be the focus areas or priorities for South Africa's um, higher education ecosystem when it comes to collaboration, transfer of knowledge and technology? Any ideas from your side on how it might look like in the future? Yeah, so I think that we really need to look at building seasoned entrepreneurs and having that sort of ecosystem where you've got experienced entrepreneurs to move into new opportunities and building them out. I think one of the things is that our venture capital community tend to be more risk averse, or let's say they invest typically post revenue and are more maybe supporting scaling of opportunities. And there's a real need for uh, people to invest in very early stage projects coming out of universities and ventures. And I think that's where there's probably quite a funding shortage. And I would hope that in this next 10 years that there, there will be better funding in that space. We've been lucky enough to participate as a special partner in the University Technology Fund which really was a first for Africa in terms of very early stage investment in university technologies. Something that's being highlighted there is also the need for the tech transfer professionals to look at how projects or opportunities are built up. So how do you manage your pipeline and build it up and de-risk opportunities so that you've really got a well-thought-out offering that can go into that early-stage VC space. And I think that's probably where there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done within South Africa as well. And I'm excited our Department of Science and Innovation has a new decadal plan and they're engaging with the tech transfer officers. And I think that through some of these initiatives where Department of Science and Innovation get together with Department of Trade and Industry and link their sort of funding opportunities where you bring industry in and people understand more about picking up, say, deep tech opportunities coming out of universities. That's probably where things are different. I think that there's been a lot around sort of IT-based companies, a lot in the financial services sector, and it's actually pushing it out further. 
into the space of deep tech and becoming familiar with that. Thank you so much, Andrew. That brings us to the end. Andrew, very much looking forward also to learning more at the upcoming event in South Africa when UIN will go all the way to uh, reconnect with South African community. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, for this very enriching discussion and goodbye. Thanks so much, Balzar. Thank you for listening to today's discussion. Follow UIN on LinkedIn, and if you are enjoying our podcast, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review in your podcast platform of choice to help other people find this content too.